This video offers some useful insights and shortcuts that will help when we go to higher order systems. The videos so far then have introduced a complete PFC code but only for the first order case and if you want the code you'll see it's in this particular M file. The code is relatively simple to write despite catering for dead time, uncertainty and constraints. Nevertheless, the derivation of the unbiased prediction and the coincidence point computations were a little cumbersome at times, and so we want to consider whether these can be handled even more simply, as this might help when we move to higher order models. So a reminder then of the basic PFC context, which is you want to track a first order target from the start point to the end point, and you do that by matching the output predictions to the target at a specific point and that gives you an equation a bit like this that your predicted value of the output ypk plus n is basically the initial value of the output plus the error between the current output and the target times 1 minus lambda to the n and lambda is the discrete equivalent of a desired closed loop settling time but we're going to change this insight slightly in a moment now the independent model formulation is a way of understanding how you correct for any bias in the predictions and we've gone through that a number of times in the earlier videos so we're not going to revisit that here we've just got the figure so you can see and what we've said is that the bias term is given by the difference between the current process output and the current model output and this bias term can be used to correct any predictions based on the model. Now there's an irony here. The objective is based on a prediction for the process output yp. However, we're using an independent model for prediction and then here's the key thing, we're inferring the process prediction from this. So we're not calculating the process prediction directly, rather what we're doing is we're calculating the model prediction and then using the bias term to infer the process prediction. So the question is, might it be possible to avoid the partially artificial computation of this bias term and place a requirement directly on the model prediction? This might be useful insight and it might save a bit of algebra. So it's reasonable to assume the following, that the expected change in the process output over the next n samples is going to be the same as the change in the model output over the next n samples. Clearly, you design your model so that this is what you expect. So we've got the expected change in the process output matches the change in the model output. Now, why is this important? You'll see next. If you look at the control law, what you will notice is that in the control law, you've got this particular term here. And that particular term is exactly what we've got at the top here. The expected change in the process output over the next n samples. So what can we do? What we can do is we can say, all right, this is the control law, which has the expected change in the process output here. And we can replace that by the expected change in the model output, the corresponding expected change. And so these two should be equivalent control laws. And so now we've eliminated the need to get this yp k plus n all together. So the prediction now only uses the model. And you'll notice, interestingly, we've no longer got this bias term. So we've got on the left hand side prediction just based on the model and on the right hand side a target which just uses process measurement. So let's have a look at this control law and you'll see the loop diagram becomes relatively simple. So we've got on the right hand side here just things which are linked to the model. Now I can get the model output by putting u there and y m here. I'm not too worried about exactly what goes, goes in n, it's just to show the structure. And clearly this 1 minus lambda term multiplies r minus yp. And so that's the bit that takes in the process measurement. And <coughs> the key thing is where is the bias term 
in this figure. And you'll see there's no explicit computation of this bias term. You don't actually need to do it explicitly. You might argue it's implicit, but it doesn't need to be explicit. So here's our derivation then. Our model prediction, standard ym k plus n, can be given by this formula here. And therefore, if we plug that model prediction into what we've now said our control law is going to be defined as, and notice we've subtracted the current model output, then this all that's changed is this term here. You'll see we've got a to the n minus 1. And now we can plug that in to match the change in term on the left, so the, the 1 minus lambda to the n times the initial error, and that is our new control law. Now, if we do a bit of algebraic manipulation, not much, it reduces to what we've got here. And what's significant about this, I'm doing it quickly for a specific reason, is because if you've recently looked at video 1.4, you will notice that this is an identical formula. So what we've shown is with a slightly different derivation, you actually end up with the same control law. But the fact that we've used that different derivation may be useful in the long term. Now, transfer function implementations, we've sort of hinted at this in an earlier um, video as well, so I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Here's our control law, and what I want to do is say, OK, can I write this down as an equivalent Z transform? So first thing I'm going to do is say, all right, ym is given by this model. So you've got bz inverse over 1 minus az inverse times the input. So what I can do is I can plug that in there and get rid of that ym. So that's, you'll see what I've done here. And now I've got a UK term here and a UK term here. So I can combine those two terms on the right hand side. And you end up with that. Now it does look a bit messy because I've not done all the simplifications yet. But one thing you will notice if you look at it yourself is that term there and that term there both cancel. And therefore, you'll see on top here you've got this 1 minus z inverse, which when you move all of this stuff to the left hand side, so you just get a, a, an equation for u, that's where your integrator is going to come from. So that's what I've done here, and you can find there's your equivalent control law. Um, you can write it in this form if you want. It should be said, however, that people will normally include the independent model explicitly rather than using this form because it makes it easier with the constraint handling. OK. So systems with delays. Where a system has a delay m, the technique we've given in this video needs only a slight modification because the current error is based on r minus the expected value of the process m samples ahead rather than on r minus the current process output. That's so we eliminate the impact of the delay. And therefore, the change is very, very simple. All we're going to do is say that the expected value of y k plus m at sample k is the current value of y plus the corresponding change in the model output. Now, we did that uh, in the video that covered delays, so I'm, again, skirting through that very, very quickly. But otherwise, everything is the same as before. So all we're going to do is match things up. We're going to say the expected change in the process output from sample m to sample m plus n is going to match the expected change in the model output from the current sample to sample n. So all that's actually changing is the top term here, and we plug that in and we get our control law. And you'll notice if you look at this that the only difference between this and the previous slide is this term in here that I'm now circling. That's the only difference. Nothing else changes. Now, if you want to, you can take this equation and you can separate out and you can say, oh, I've got a yp term here and a ym term here and a ym and so on. And you can write it as nested loops or as a transfer function. But I'm not going to pursue that because it's not particularly interesting. So in summary, we've demonstrated an alternative set of steps for deriving the PFC 
controller. The concept is to derive the required change in the process output and argue that this change can equally be applied just to the model output. And such a derivation avoids the need to explicitly compute this bias correction term. Nevertheless, in the first order case, the control law reduces to the same algebra, and you're not surprised at that because you should get the same answer if the steps are correct.